when you are. All righty, everyone, we will get started. So welcome to the July Lunch and Learn for the Seattle's, uh, chap Seattle chapter IFMA. Uh, my name is Sally Chen. I am program's co-chair along with Tona Cal that everybody works for, most some people work for. <laughs> we are uh, program's committee co-chairs. And on behalf of the board, I just want to thank you all for joining us today. Um, first things first, I do want to thank our sponsor, Delta Connects for sponsoring. Let's give everybody, let's give Delta Connects a hand. Uh, IFMA, we are able to provide such great events and uh, events for you folks uh, through the generous support of our sponsors. Um, if you folks, if uh, anybody is interested in sponsoring an event, for instance, like our upcoming boat tour next month, uh, get some exposure for your company, come see me or come see Tona. Um, and I also want to thank Brian Rush, Tona Cow, and the Snow Owl Library for hosting us in this fantastic facility. Let's give him a hand. And let's see, for uh, our upcoming events, we have a Lunch and Learn next month. It is August 16th. It's a Thursday. It'll be at Benaroya Hall. That's typically where we host our events. Um, it will be on um, gaps and emergency preparedness. And then we will also have, um, like I mentioned before, a boat tour uh, that following week. It'll be lots of fun. It'll be, there'll be food. And it's really mainly to thank our uh, members, um, welcome new members, and also swear on our new officers. So um, check your email for any updates coming up. And uh, we are looking for sponsors for that event, if you folks are interested uh, in getting some exposure. Come see us. Okay, so now on to our, um, our programs here. Today's program will be about, about facility credentials. And we have three, three wonderful speakers, um, Brian Rush, Tona Cow, and Christina May. Uh, Brian Rush has been in facility management for nearly 30 years around the Northwest. Um, he's worked in multiple environments such as uh, data centers, government, um, medical devices, telecommunications, and now he is in a public sector with libraries. Uh, Brian Rush holds his FMP as well as his CFM credentials. Our second speaker will be Tona Cow. She's obtained her certificate in facility management from the UW, and she has gone on to earn her FMP. She's currently working on her CFM as well as, well, actually, no, she already has her SFM, her sustain, or SFP, her sustainable facility <laughs> professional certificate. Um, she is this facilities specialist for Snow Owl Libraries. Um, and if you folks listen to, um, sorry, I'm going to brag on her just because she's my uh, co-chair. But if you folks listen to Mike Petruski, uh, the Workplace Innovators podcast, she will be um, interviewed by Mike Petruski uh, in September. And she will also be speaking on our Women in FM uh, panel, the IFMA Lunch and Learn in October. Our last speaker is Christina May. She's the program manager at the uh, Facility Management Certificate Program for the UW. Um, she has a passion for expanding student access to long, lifelong learning and building strategic community partnerships. Um, before that, she was a program manager f at the uh, Bellevue Com College Com Continuing Education. So, I guess, let's just get this ball rolling. Brian? All right, thank you. Uh, I'm Brian Rush, and I'm a facilities management professional like many of you. I'm also someone that uh, tries to juggle many different balls. Uh, as you know, many of you are either service providers, it's roofing, mechanical systems, electrical, you name it, we do it. Supply chain management, real estate, vendor relations, dispute resolution, conference rooms, comfort, safety, health, environment, pest control. Um, did I say Tony Cow? Because I also work for her too. So. Um, <laughs> Yeah, so I'm the facility manager of Snow Isle Libraries. Uh, Snohomish and Island counties are huge. Uh, I think the last time I checked, and it may or may not be accurate, but I think we're, we're bigger than 
many states. I want to say it's about five states when you put us both together. We're bigger than Rhode Island. We're bigger than Massachusetts. Uh, we're bigger than Vermont. We're, we're bigger than quite a few states. I mean, that's how much reach we really have. We've got 25 locations, 24 libraries in the service center where you're at now. Uh, we provide library services. It's information intense. We have data centers. We have computer rooms. It's not just about books and CDs and DVDs. It's about programs, children, teaching people, community center. It, we do uh, provide a ton of services for the community. And I really didn't realize that when I first came here. It was kind of a shock. You know, I, I was excited. But at the same time, I'm like, wow, look at all these cool things that are going on here. The library is just a fantastic place. And it's a resource that the taxpayers provided to everybody like a gift. And to be the facility manager here is probably one of the greatest things I've ever have been able to do. And I, I can regress a little bit and go back about my career. But um, this is the most rewarding that I've had the opportunity to be a part of. And uh, just to step back a little bit, I, you know, I can even go back. I don't know if some of you remember Al's Auto Supply. I used to work there, you know, old Al Wexler. Um, and uh, then I got into GTE. Worked my way up. I've had just about every title you could have from administrative services or facility services. And I can remember even when the IT department first started to get invented and we started purging all the boat anchors and typewriters off desks. And we brought in that first IBM PS2. There it was. It sat on a table for 10 people and not all of us used it. Boy, did that revolutionize the workplace and change things. I'm sure some of you have seen how that's happened. Uh, from cooling loads to cabling to just, you know, getting the ugly wire uh, rat's nest out from underneath the desk and not having a safety hazard, another facilities issue. Um, so that's really, I don't, do I have the clicker for my presentation? There it is. Thank you. Hopefully I hit this the right way. Um, so I'm going to talk some about the credentials. And... Um, what happened in my career, to kind of give you my story, I got to GTE, started to learn about facilities. They asked me if I wanted the job. I said, no, I'm not really interested in facilities. You know, I wanted to either be like an engineer, I wanted to be a graphic designer. Uh, I was really big in computer-aided design. I actually got to GTE because I came in to be a graphic artist. And we were working on Yellow Page advertising and inserting all the artwork into the ads. And you know, I'm very diligent at it and so on, but my assignment ended, and, but they didn't want me to go anywhere. So they said, hey, you know, we got this opening as a materials handler. And this is in the 80s. It was hard to get a job. I think unemployment was like 11 to 13 uh, percent, things like that. It's all interest rates were way up there, too. Um, so I said, okay, I'll, I don't have anything better, better to do. I'll stick around. And worked my way up. Materials handler one, materials handler two, um, you know, there was a time when you say the secret to my success. I started in a mailroom, right? And then I uh, got into actual facilities. I got to wear a tool belt. Got to be a technician. Got to be uh, go to roof school. Went to roof school. I'll never forget that, you know? Oh, this is blackjack. Oh, okay. Yeah, be careful how much of that you put on because you may never get it off. Um, things like that. Learn about electrical. Then I got trained as an electrician. Moved out to facility assistant too. I uh, was running around uh, trying to fix lights, replace ballasts, uh, look at gate actuators, gate motors, things like that, um, and make sure I could keep all my fingers, too. So I worked my way up and down, and I loved my tool belt. I loved going to my desk because I also was really big into computers, computer-aided design, AutoCAD, all these different things related to buildings. And uh, construction management was something that I always had an affinity for, but I really didn't think that was me because I wanted to be an engineer. I wanted to be kind of an analytical and design guy. But, you know, so facilities, all of a sudden, I started to embrace it. And I realized IFMA was out there. It's the 90s now, mid-90s. And I really wanted to get into it. And I could have, because now I had the experience. I had the education. But I would never set aside the time to do it. And I, so I had to ask myself, gain valuable professional knowledge. You know, here I was learning all this stuff. How was I going to squeeze it anymore? And I remember the UW certificate program back in the 90s. And it's, it's very similar to what it is now, but different, I'm sure, um, that we'll hear about that. But I remember going down to that. And back then when we went down, we had to go down to UW campus. And we do it at night. So I couldn't really fit in IFMA. IFMA wasn't working for me. My coworkers were doing IFMA. I wanted to try and find the time to do IFMA because, but at the same time, I didn't know what I didn't know. I didn't put it together. 
I can know a lot about electrical, I can know about furniture, I can reassemble that pedestal and that storage unit and that cabinet and all these different things. But I didn't understand how all the different impacts, the organization of all these different things could transcend or become a process, a policy, a procedure, a standard. I didn't understand how it affected finance, budgeting, planning. I mean, when it comes down to it, people need to plan that you, or know that you have a plan for how to control the environment which you work in and how you spend money. Really. So, IFMA, I went to it, started to learn about it, went to the events, went to the lunch and learn, went to the education symposium. I was really finding out there's things here I don't even know and things that we can do and there's this, if you really look forward, if you become kind of a futurist, got a vision, you can see, wow, you know what, computers are coming along, we can start sensing all these environments. If you start putting all these different technologies together, even things that people aren't inventing and selling you yet, there's a lot of potential here. You know, and then I, I remember thinking even roofs, reflective heat loads. Well, you certainly don't want a black roof in Arizona, or maybe you don't, maybe you do. Or actually you want a black roof in Arizona because you want to absorb all that heat because you don't provide heat in the winter, and that's going to transcend into your building and give you heat offset. That's what facility managers do. And then roofers get into it, and they start figuring that kind of thing out. Gosh, we wouldn't lose a black roof in Arizona, but now we would because we want to bring artificial heat into the building just like we do with a solar panel. Things like that, okay? So, proved analysis, vision, and critical thinking. That's what IFMA and the credentials bring. You can create standards. You can start benchmarking what you do against your counterparts in like industries. So I was in, worked for T-Mobile for a while. I got brought over from Verizon. We supported 664 locations at Verizon across, uh, I'll, I'll say it's uh, five states, but two of the states we only had part of them. Okay, but we definitely had Washington, Idaho, and Oregon. Some of them were phone marts, retail, lease. A lot of them were own location, central switch locations before even cell phones came into use. So I got to see how the towers got built, how they got placed, what the impacts of earthquakes were, and how we did subleasing to GT MobileNet because really years in advance, we knew, we knew that uh, we were going to merge with somebody else and probably spin off our cell ser service and actually become somebody totally different. And then Bell Atlantic came along and we became Verizon. So we had to figure out how are we going to break up our central officing, offices. How are we going to provide co-location when the giant internet boom went bust? And we put all these little cages in there and we had to double up our power and infrastructure. So we went through things like that. So you begin to gain as a facility manager saying, hey, I've got not just power issues, I've got cooling, heat load, I've got security, access, we've got trade secrets. I mean, stepped into medical devices yet, yeah, boy, that's a whole other world. Um, so you create those standards, you can start measuring things, you can start looking ahead to the future and you know what you're going to need to be doing. Uh, it advances your career. People start working with you, they start realizing what you're doing and they say, hey, I, I, I want to work with this guy on this because he understands this. I want to work on a team energy at Verizon. That was something that uh, I had no idea was coming up. I had a plenty of workload. I'm working on the maintenance side. We had maintenance side, we had capital. So we had uh, uh, five capital project managers and back in the day Verizon was the big gorilla. I mean, if they, if they, they just, they were the, not just the tail that wagged the dog, they were the dog. Bigger than Boeing, we did capital build outs all the time. We'd go into a building, oh, we're going to double the size, keep the switch up. And we were, we were keeping fleets of general contractors together. When we had a bid meeting, we had to book an auditorium at a, at a giant convention hall. We couldn't have a room this small. When we did a bid package, we had stacks of bid packages up on the walls. So you learn about volume. And I don't know, maybe Lou saw that, I don't know if... Anybody I have in the room right now remembers those days, but they were something else. And so you learn about volume, specification, scope of work, and how you can think about measuring your, your, your performance and so on. So again, credential advances your career, helps you stand out, helps you talk about things, helps you work with people and communicate. And you get recognition for it. Uh, I had some really good mentors along the way. And uh, I value every single one of them uh, to, to no end. I would say this, that uh, uh, they've helped craft who I am, who I am as a facilities person. And uh, uh, along with getting the professional credentials and learning about providing services and giving the people I work to confidence in me through IFMA by able to transcend, transcend and see all the different core competencies, which I'm going to go into with uh, 
the awareness and insight and understanding with also being able to receive feedback and see how am I going to best support the business or the organization that I'm here to serve. Because it's, it's, it's not about the facilities. As you know, we're people process place. We support the business. But what we are, we're the foundation. The more solid that foundation, the less chance it can be shaken. When we're a solid foundation, they can provide the highest quality product. They can, they can achieve things where they, they can count on the facility. That this is robust enough, strong enough, and a solid foundation that they can do all the things they need to do to provide services and support the public in my world now, or keep the network up. So, I hope I go the right way. I did. So, we have three credentials at IFMA. Uh, the facility management professional, which I think is, it's, it's the beginning, it's the first line. Anyone can earn it. You have to go through the modules. It will take time. Nobody's going to grab it in one month and be done, unless you're Tona. <laughs> so, I don't even think Tona got it done in one month. Okay, two months, that's pretty impressive. Um, they give you one year to get it done. And it's, it's fantastic. It's got, uh, we'll go into that next, it's got some, uh, it really gives you an excellent start to facilities management. It really covers just about everything. I was really impressed with the program. I have an FMP. Sustainability Facility Professional. I started that module, never finished it. I got this new job at the library system and I had a bunch of other things going on and I let my one year expire and never finished it. Another story of my life, didn't quite finish something. I should have gone into facilities and got my credentials so much sooner. I didn't get my credentials until about 2010. So I waited an awful long time. I thought, I'm a professional, I know this stuff. But once I got it all, I was able to step back and go, wow, I know so much more. I understand leasing, I understand acquisition, I understand about advantageous uh, lease points in a contract. How do I get to those? Well, what I need, I need to have uh, access control into my lease. Because we were running around at T-Mobile trying to get all kinds of cell sites put up. Hey, what's going on in your backyard? That's a great space and we need a tower here. Huh, what? Yeah, I'll give you a lease. But say we had to get some advantageous lease tactics built into that that this guy didn't even know about. And yet we'd sign a lease for 500 bucks and he didn't know he'd be sitting on a $5 million revenue generating machine every day. And we just got a lease for 500 bucks. You know, so, but that's changed quickly because then you had these cell site lease tower companies come in and uh, represent these guys, and boy, did the rules change. The minute their first lease expired, things changed, and they brought us in. So that's another thing facilities guys think about, because we, we understand the building, we understand the land, we start looking at acquisition, long-term costs, disposal, when do we outgrow it, what is our expansion capability, and how are we going to manage for that and plan for it 10 years down the road. So sustainability facility professional, Tony got that. That's environmental stewardship. It, uh, uh, and we'll get into that. Then certified facilities manager. Anybody get the SFP as well? You have to go through the modules. I will tell you this much, it's a lot harder than the FMP. A lot harder. It's, uh, I would say, by a factor of four. Yeah, and you can take it online or you can do it in sit down courses. I recommend online. Certified facilities manager. There are no course modules. There are no quizzes. You study, you get ready, and you go to this little room with everybody watching you. You can't have anything on you. They pat you down, you go in the room, and uh, you take the test. You need to go to the bathroom? Boy, you're bumming. <laughs> uh, you take the exam. They tell you whether or not you passed or failed right then. They do not tell you your score. They don't tell you what you got wrong. I don't know if any of you have ever taken a credentials exam, but let's say there's five right answers. So you get 13 different things to pick from, and five of them are the right answer. But you gotta pick all five, and you gotta put them in the right order. You get one of them out of order, the whole thing's wrong. Okay, so the CFMs are really, uh, for those of you who've been through it, anybody here been through the CFM? I see Robert Blakely and Ed Bales, myself, oh, David Longmire, we went through it at the same time. Yeah, yeah, and we had a little study group for that. I think, what was it, uh, She By Law or something like that, a little cheat code about how to prioritize stuff. Uh, didn't make sense to anybody else, but it sure made sense to the guys going for the CFM exam. <laughs> and uh, so, and you know, we got that from people before us. You know, facilities about mentorship. It's, uh, there's a lot of that. And being a credentialed person means anybody that you're working with, they can count on you. They know you've been there. They know that you know something about everything that they're gonna do. And for those of you that are the associate members here, that, that you know, I look at roofing, I look at 
Snohomish County PUD. I look at sound maintenance services and um, McDonald Miller and uh, I think Guy Brown Fire Systems it was. So um, that, you know that we know what we're talking about and how we're going to understand how it impacts our buildings. But we don't know everything because we, we need to rely and network with you and have vendor partnerships. So the FMP. FMP is four knowledge domains. And you notice they say knowledge domains, focus areas, or core competencies, depending on what you're into. And that really has to do with how much are we digging in to the fine layers? How much are we either getting into the details or thinking strategically or tactically? Operations and maintenance. That's really when you talk about a facilities manager, sometimes facilities maintenance manager. That's what we think of. It's operations and maintenance. Just keep my facility running. I need the lights on, need it comfortable, need power, need water, need to make sure the storm drains drain, need to make sure the grass gets cut, and oh gee, the, the number one thing. What quality of toilet paper do you got, and is there any in there, and does the soap work? <laughs> you know, because heaven forbid, I come into my building that morning, and, and the trash isn't emptied. My goodness, the one thing that I need you to do, Chris, and you can't do it, <laughs> you know? So then, you know, you, you get that whole crisis management thing going on. So finance and business as well, that's another knowledge area. Project management, I think, is huge and completely underestimated. I remember when I was a, a facilities manager, or wanted to be a facilities person, I think I was a, I was a facilities coordinator. And they go, oh, well, you get, we're going to have you do a lot of the small project management. I remember going through my first three projects, and uh, I, I worked for this person who's got an MBA from Texas A&M, and uh, her name was Christine, highly organized, very professional, clean cut. Everything just came easy to Christy, it seemed like. Well, she worked really hard, and um, I got my first few project man projects assigned to me, and they're three, and they're so small. And yet, oh, I was stressed out. I mean, I've got 12 people moving here. I've got to make sure I get their phones up, trash cans there, you know, all the little cubicle reconfigurations and the space plan. And uh, my desk was just a mess. I was not organized. I didn't understand all the other impacts. I didn't know that I needed to check in with the uh, phone guys uh, for moving some of the phones or changing the features on the buttons. All these little things that I learned about as a facilities guy. So project management. Then leadership and strategy. You know, how are you leading? How are you leading your vendors, especially if you're in new at facilities? You, you may not be supervising anybody, but you're setting an example everywhere you go. I always remember one of the things they said to me was manage by walking around. Make sure they see you. They want to know that you're checking out their facilities. People see you. They know you care. They don't see you. Where is the guy? You never see him. Definitely a challenge for me when we have a footprint that's as big as five states, and uh, you can't even go to all the buildings in one day. I always love it, vendor comes in, hey, you know, I'm gonna go see all your buildings tomorrow. Ha, <laughs> good luck on that one. Tell me how it is from Darrington to Edmonds. Um, so, FMP, great program. You can learn a, a great deal from that. It's a great first start, and it's not something you have to maintain as well. So once you've got it, you got it. it stays with you. Sustainability Facility Professional. Focus areas. Tone is going to probably talk about this a little more, so I won't dive into it too much. But strategy and alignment for sustainable. So we heard about LEED. I don't know how many of you heard about Green Globes. I think Green Globes is better than LEED. Green Globes is more encompassing. Green Globes includes clean programs, includes the health and uh, environment within it, more so than just how do I do a, a carbon footprint? How does my building uh, use energy? How does my building use resources? How does it conserve? I think Green Globes is the way to go because it also brings in your janitorial and the health impacts. Lee doesn't do that. So that's something that sustainability facility professionals will think about. And really it gets all the way down to the core. What's the commitment of the organization you work for? And I don't want to get too far ahead, but how do you manage a sustainable facility? Boy, you start out doing a really good job with LEED and then all of a sudden, or, or, or with Green Globes or whatever it is you're trying to do, we have composting programs and you get you don't have a good sustainable program. You get a good quick start, but all of a sudden you realize there's hiccups you didn't think about. Um, oops. Operating sustainable facilities. So are you thinking about all the other impacts, your recycling and so on? Tone is going to get into that. CFM. Um, here we are. It allows you to see how all job tasks and competencies intersect and impact your facilities operation and organization. And sometimes even though you see these things, you may see them, as we go on, I'm going to get into what I think is probably the most important aspect of a facility manager, 
is communication. Because you can see everything, but how are you going to communicate and inform the people that depend on you? Requirement there is you need a master or bachelor's degree in facilities plus three years of experience or any other education level in five years. It used to be a little more stringent. Back in the day when I got it, 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 it was, I think it was eight years at one point. They even had to stretch out to eight years. I only needed five, but um, I have two degrees, but I don't have a master's degree. I don't even have a bachelor's degree. I got associate's degrees, okay? Um, so mine's in business, mine's in finance, accounting, general sciences, okay? And then I did do the electrical, electrician thing. I was going to go be an IBW electrician, but I got hired in to be a facilities coordinator, and that pretty much ended everything. So operations and maintenance. I'm going to go over the, next I'm going to go over the 11 core competence of, uh, competencies of being a CFM, a certified facilities manager. And they really, the FMP, the SFP, they include all of these other things. Operations and maintenance, it's your condition assessments. You oversee how everything's running. How are you watching these things? How are, are you inspecting them? Do you, do you inspect what you expect? Do you communicate your expectations to your vendors, your, your, the people doing the work? And how are you doing that? How are you checking it? You want to oversee all your baseline services. You've got your landscaping, your janitorial, your pest control. There's certain things you need to just operate effectively so you aren't caught up with all of those different things and you hope that they're running up on a plane and just smoothly because everybody depends on them daily and we don't want to think about them. No news is good news. Again, remember that, that uh, TP and soap that got missed and how freaked out that that happened. That happens. So service level agreements, scope of work, specifications. When you need to buy something, fix something, change something, upgrade something, who are they going to look to to write the spec? Or are you going to let the vendor write their own spec? Great. I would love to go sell you a car, and I'll tell you exactly what you want, how much you want to pay, what color you're going to get, and, and whether or not you get a warranty at all. Oh, by the way, this is a lifetime contract. You're not allowed to get out of it. Okay, well, that's what the vendor wants. Maybe not all of you, but think about it. That's a great sell. Well, you better write it for the advantageous terms for yourself. Performance management, cost control, things like that. That's facilities guy. We work with purchasing, but purchasing isn't going to be an expert on roofing systems, mechanical systems, controls, and so on. So you also need to do planning. Planning, planning, planning. That's what facilities managers do. We plan our frequencies of service for preventive maintenance. We decide if it's going to be preventive maintenance, predictive maintenance. We learn about all those different kinds of maintenance. Hey, run to fail. Run to fail is not a bad option for some things. It's the best cost control for our business. Maybe that's it. People think, oh, no, we don't want to do that. It means we have no money. No, no, sometimes that's all right. Uh, it's not a high impact item. And then standards. You start setting standards for how you do things because then you can either start reusing things. You upgrade at one facility, but I still got this other control panel for this other system that's just the right size with the right device points and everything, I can reuse it over here. We had a need for this really cool barbecue that we could automate and have all everything done at lunchtime so that we could set it off at 10 a.m. and come back and it all be done. And we got that from over here at the Lake Stevens building. I'm just making that up, but I can remember um, that with the GTE guys doing stuff like that. So that was back in the day. So that's operations and maintenance, scheduling, planning, where are you putting your resources? How can you consolidate your resources? How can you accomplish multiple things at the same time while you're taking care of something and keeping it clean? And it's all dependent upon the service level that your customer needs you to maintain. Finance and business. So buildings cost money. They cost money to maintain. What's the life that you need of your building? Something really neat happened here at the library system. I finally got over to a, to a location where every, we're pretty much owners. And we're going to be there a long time. When I was at Verizon, I thought, gee, we, we own some of these facilities, but what we found out is the technology changed so much that we had to tear apart our brick and mortar and change it. And um, that, there I learned, you know, boy, you can do anything. You got money for it, you can build anything. You can do it any way you want. You can come off the grid. You can put your own fuel cell in. You could, you know, create your own car wash. We did that. You know, we were washing so many cars, we built a car wash. So um, value and justification. You know, does it make sense for us to do that? How are we going to compare that? How many cars are we going to wash? Does it make sense? How much time do we save? What do we pay those people to go drive to a car wash? How about to have that credit card, be off the road, things like that? Uh, budgeting. 
got to be doing a forecasting a budget. Things change. Sometimes stuff breaks down. I remember when I first got here, um, I can't remember what the project was. I think we were going to do a flooring project somewhere. And we found a huge crack in the boiler. And we were feeding, I think, 60 gallons per minute into that boiler, 60 gallons per minute into that boiler. It was running 100% all the time. And we were risking that that boiler was going to fail because it, if, if it did fail, that 60 gallons per minute was going to fill up my attic, fill up the penthouse, fill up the Snowmish library. And the only way we'd know that it went off and that any of that happened is if we showed up, opened the door, and we were greeted by a whole bunch of water. And I don't know about you guys, but water and books do not mix. So, and it was ugly. So, but no, we, we got it taken care of. We didn't even know what was going on. We had to really assess our vendor performance and say, what have you guys been doing? And we didn't do that. I know Rob remembers that. Um, so, budgeting, contracting, estimating, outsourcing, performance measures, and our procedures and policies. I think a lot of you know a lot of these different things. Outsourcing, highly important. Estimating for your budget. Estimating for your repairs. Contracting, if I haven't said enough, get things on your own paper. You want to control performance and so on. Project management used to just scare the heck out of me. Then I went to Sonosite, and they're all about project management. And I hadn't even gone to T-Mobile, and T-Mobile is an absolute project management culture. Everybody there is a PMP or this and that. You have to renew your project management training skills every single year. They make you do it, not because uh, PMI makes you do it. So you define and program. You, have, you, you understand what are you going to do for your projects, how are you going to sequence them, when are you going to do them, what quarter are you going to do them in, and who are you going to assign them to, and is it the right skill set, or is it a growth opportunity? So you develop your projects, you plan, you schedule, you implement. You manage, you monitor, and you oversee. You better be checking in. And you can't just say, oh, yeah, I got that done. No, you ask them to verify, did you get that done? How much did you get done? You have change management. Think changes are going to happen. Are you documenting your change? You know, I can sit here and talk about all these things because I'm sitting here thinking in my background, gosh, I, I don't do that very good. You know, I, I really need to do better at that. I mean, you're going to do that. You're a facilities guy. You're going to have to wear a lot of different hats, and you're only going to be able to do part of what you can do. You may not always be able to focus on everything. Not everybody works for this massive facilities organization like JLL or, or Heinz or Johnson Controls. I mean, that would be nice. And even those people working there are going, hey, I don't know about you, but we didn't have all that. Well, when I came here, we, we hadn't had a facilities manager. We had one. Uh, uh, I think Rebecca's, or was in the room. There she is. You know, we had one. But facilities wasn't her background. It wasn't her forte. She's a librarian. So for 49 years, there was no facilities guy, no facilities professional in place. So when I came in, I saw tons of opportunity. Wow, we got to do this. We got to do that. We got this in place. Couldn't do it all. That was one guy. And now we've got Tona, now everything happens, I work for her. Um, so uh, then, uh, then we, we also, we got Tom, we got Tom before Tona, and that was just huge. He's just a, a really good technician, kind of a jack of all trades, you've all got one, and that really helps. And, uh, and the best is that he's really good with people. People, management, communication, really important. So evaluate and report your outcomes for your projects. People need to know how you did, why we did it, and so on. How is it making a difference? Leadership and strategy. You lead facilities. If you're the facilities manager, they want to know that there's someone that's credentialed, that's got some kind of background in these things. You want to promote, encourage, and empower. So you want to build confidence in your people. You want them to have confidence. You don't want to give them any more than what they can handle. You don't want to set people up to fail. But you also want to let them grow wings and accomplish things on their own. If you tell them exactly how to do everything that they're going to do, are they really growing? No. You want them to learn as they go, develop a plan, and maybe run it by you. You can you set that, but you better be watching over them because they're in your care. Are you teaching them? Are you coaching them? Are you helping them be successful? That's our job as a supervisor and a manager. Highly important. Then you want to oh, plan strategically. That's kind of tough because sometimes the needs of the business change. I mean, you can predict, oh, I'm probably going to have to replace that chiller in five years and so on. Uh, those are some of the, the things you can do. But you don't know what's going to happen. Guess what? We found a failed boiler. So guess what? We didn't do that carpeting job over here because we only had a finite amount of money and we needed to project our resources differently. Those are two different things. Or maybe it was a roofing job. Actually, I think it was a roofing job we, we went away from. But I'm just picking on the roofers. Um, <laughs> Uh, alignment with organizational goals and objectives. Again, that can change. That can be, it's, 
you hope, I think in a library, we're, we're pretty stable with our goals and, and needs, but a business isn't always that way. Boy, you know, oh, 10% cut, 10% cut, 10% cut. Oh, we need to do a moving budget line. Uh, we're gonna report something different for the dividend this time, so we need to change that. Oh, we've got a release coming up here, so uh, we need you to, you know, do X and prepare for that lease. So, and then you also wanna always assess your services and your needs. Are you meeting the needs of the customer? Are there other qualitative things you can do as, as you benchmark as a facilities guy? Are you getting, uh, capturing all the points that you need to compare, cost per square foot, cost per patron, cost per user, cost per staff member, uh, cost per unit of runtime that, that you're on. And we'll get into some really cool stuff here in a minute. Environmental stewardship, sustainability, uh, life cycle process, creating awareness, organizational commitment I think is number one. You know, we can say that uh, we're gonna do a lead building or we're gonna do green globes or we're gonna, bring in all this neat stuff and maybe apply for Energy Star, which gosh, I so want to do this year. I really think we're going to nail it. Um, but having the time to go through the application process and actually commit, you actually have to start at the very beginning. Hey, we're going to make commitment to it. We're going to put it at the purchasing and procurement function. We're actually going to find out that even though there's this giant misnomer that says, hey, being, it doesn't make any sense. If somebody says, gosh, being sustainable, being lead or being green globes, it's actually going to cost me more. Couldn't be further from the truth. Why would I want to buy stuff that I have to continue to buy in a solid state fashion when I can be sustainable, which costs less in the long term? <laughs> but yet we just said it costs more? I don't think so. Um, so if we really, if we have to organize ourselves accordingly and make sure that we start at the very beginning thinking that way. And that's where a facility manager comes in because you're going to think of the finance, the purchasing, the procurement, the standards, scope of work, everything that you're doing and planning for it at the very beginning because you've got that solid foundation, right? Because you've put that in place. You, you know how all these things transition across all the different competencies. That's you. So, it's a life cycle process. I think we've all talked about that. Uh, you know, if something starts out great, then it starts to wear down, and eventually you gotta replace it. Communication. Communication planning. You have customers, some like emails, some like direct communication, some want a little bit of both, some want a special report, some want a roles and accountability matrix, or some want, um, who knows what they want, but there's different forms of communication, but you have to be consistent. My weakness, I just wanna go do stuff, right? I just wanna go fix it, I wanna control it, I want to emphasize to you right now, that's the most important thing. Take it from me, I know. Uh, you've gotta be informative and effective, you gotta have clarity, brevity, and if you've got ideas and plans, share them with somebody because you, you don't control the decision making. You're the facilities guy. You control your little, your little realm, but it has to fit into the business. And if you're not communicating with people, they don't know. This helps you have clarity to do that. What questions to ask, what things to consider, and how is your internal customer talking to you? How can you best understand them? You get that from IFMA and going through this program. So, and again, there's internal communication, external. What do you need? What can you, sh what can you show them and uh, demonstrate? And like I said, it's the most important, in my opinion, of all the core competencies is communication. What do we do? How do we provide it? And how can we help? So uh, emergency preparedness and business continuity. Now it's gonna be a special focus area next week or next month. So you wanna plan programs. You wanna work with your customers. Sometimes we put this aside because nothing goes wrong. Well. This is a definite, uh, you can't set it and forget it. You gotta reevaluate it, you grow, you contract, your business needs change, your uh, service platforms change, you're now an IT driven organization versus a non-IT, or you've gone all wireless, you're not wireless, um, you've got a fleet, you don't have a fleet, um, you have an electronics manufacturing operation, you look out at the, at the finance applications, if you were to actually miss a quarter, you're, half a billion dollar business, so this is at Sonosite. They looked at it and said, wow, you know, if we had this major earthquake in the Puget Sound, the big one hit us. If we weren't back up and running in 120 days, we would actually go out of business. And when they saw that, they're like, oh my goodness. Our supply chain and how we pay our bills and structure, we wouldn't be able to afford our employees. We would no longer be an international organization and we'd go under. That was a big deal for them. So they spent two years on it. And I learned a lot from that. Um, but that is something you have to look forward to. It's not just saying, oh, I'm gonna go here, I'm gonna set up this. It's how you're gonna pay your people, what are they gonna be doing, so many other things. 
And also, it's what's going on around you. And how are you going to be even to inspect your facilities? Because a lot of people say, oh, well, I own that building. I'm going to go up there. Oh, no, FEMA says you ain't going anywhere near it. Well, wait a minute. I'm the building owner. So what? We don't have you on the list, and we don't know who you are. So if you don't get credentials ahead of time, you can't even go to your building because they've got the whole area cordoned off because Eli Miller, or Eli Lilly, excuse me, uh, three doors down from you, you didn't even know, happened to have uh, uh, Ebola under consideration and this and that, and they got a big crack in their facility. It could be escaped, so we don't let anybody within 10-mile range, and guess what? Your building's inside that. Well, that's what we found out right there at Canyon Park. Okay, so they had three different really toxic things that they were studying for a special research facility in a real small building, and we found out that uh, they were right next to us. <sighs> so those are the kind of things that come up. That's a little bit of an extreme one. So it's continuing operations. Human factors. Whew. I don't like how I sit at my desk. I don't like the noise. I don't like the cold draft. Um, <laughs> Yeah, okay. Well, I try and keep it within range, but I'm sorry, that's not my range. Yeah, but what about the guy next to you? You know, and so on, so on, so on. Uh, oh, there's bugs coming in, you know, uh, you can just go on. There's these smells, I got these smells, and I'm just like, it's gotta be the guy sitting next to you. Because um, <laughs> it's not coming from my building or my equipment. So, uh, sorry, I can't help you with that. You may want to talk to his boss. Um, so yeah. Uh, we actually had a cubicle workstation where it was actually deemed a safety hazard because if the guy went in, sat down, and anybody jiggled anything by that, this guy had stacks of papers like this high. And that was at Sono site. They make portable ultrasound devices in Canyon Park. I mean, it was an actual safety hazard because if anything fell, it could be a, a whole cascading avalanche and we would have never found him until the smell came out. Um, so again, uh, roles and objectives uh, with human factors. I mean, it's about people, process, and place. That really used to be the old facilities mantra, the IFMA thing was facilities, processes, place. We're supporting our customers. Uh, you know, what do we do? How do we support it? Who does what? How do you delegate it and assign it appropriately? And then you, we want to motivate our staff to really get behind a lot of the human factors issues because they can sometimes take 90% of our day away if we don't handle it right. Communication, human factors, things like that. Situational awareness. How are you addressing with the right emphasis? How are you applying the right amount of emotion, feeling, sincerity, dedication to the things that you work on? Or are you going, you know, I know you're cold. I could, you know, don't really care. And they think that you don't have any empathy and you don't listen to them. We have to be that, that, those, those coaches. That's a facilities guy. Gosh, I care about you. You know, I'm going to take care of that. I know this is really driving. You can't think. You can't do your job. We need to make sure people can you know, we've got to have, but at the same time, I've got this giant boiler leak going on or whatever. You better, you've got to be able to delegate and think about these things or at least communicate back to them. It says, hey, you're super important to me. I've got to take care of this first, but I'm going to get to you next or a third or whatever it is. So there you go. You learn that. You learn how to stop, slow down, and think about what are you saying. Or if you did do something wrong, go back and readdress it. But make sure the customers feel important. Quality. Create standards. Boy, that is a challenge. Because each one of your customers, they get that really cool catalog that gets sent in underneath everything, and they want to come and buy all new furniture because they like that one. Well, that's not our standard. I know, but that's the one I want, and I'm funding it. Yeah, but that's not our standard. Yeah, you don't want to go there. Um, those things, I'm sure you've all been there. Or standards of performance, standards with your vendors. Uh, you set that, you control that. You're a facilities guy, and you learn how to do that with the IFMA programs. You do that with the CFM. And are you going to be excellent, or you just want to be good? You want to be fair. You know, sometimes those are cost value decisions. You don't need to be the best. We just want class C buildings. We don't need class A. I don't need to have a clean room cleaning environment. I don't need to be like Harborview. I just, you know, I just don't want to see the dirt. You know, I don't need to have my landscaping like uh, uh, a golf course. I just need to look good and clean. That's all. So you decide what level you're going to go for. So you analyze, monitor, inspect. Again, go back to your contracts. Make sure you put those quality control measures in there. You start with your quality assurance. You learn all about quality assurance. So quality assurance is you do it on the front end. You put those things in place so you can monitor them later and you make sure that all these little things are there or you ask your customer, how are you going to do it? Because I don't need to know your business, but you can show me what do you do to ensure quality when you deliver it to my doorstep. You learn to ask those questions. Because if you're not, then you're, you're just, you're, you're not really, looking out for the business. You have no way to measure things after the fact. So get that in the contract. Then you have quality control. Now you can say, hey, you said you'd do this, but you're not. Hey, you said you'd meet this metric, but you're not. 
Or you are. Matter of fact, you're exceeding it. I'm so happy with you. Thanks a lot. I really value you. Boy, they love to hear that. So, so you develop and improve the process. It's just a constant cycle, right? I think we've all been through that. Next, real estate and property management. Again, if you're an owner and you just own, you're in pretty good shape. But again, those are assets. You better make sure you maintain them. You're responsible for them. If there's changes in the environment, you've got to pay for them and so on. Uh, acquisition, disposition, do you turn a lease back over? Do you improve it? Or if you did improve it, did you actually find out? I love this. T-Mobile, I love this example. They leased a, just a, a typical Class C building, put in a massive concrete bunker, generators and all this stuff, and then they turned it back over to the landlord, and the landlord comes back and goes, whoa, 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 wait a minute. You have to turn it back over to us in the same space that you already had. So that whole big concrete structure, we need that whole thing taken out and redone. It was probably, I don't know, 23,000 square feet whole bunch of work digging out the basement, they had to restore it. Oops. Big oops. Um, so move, add, change. Weekly moving. If you're supporting thousands and thousands of, of people in your building, you're going to have to move them in and out really quick. And you're going to have weekly moves. They have phones. They have stuff. They provide services. They need to be back up and running immediately. When are you going to do that? When are you going to have your vendor teams there? Who's the contacts? So on. Uh, leasing, allocation, I won't get into that, but those are big topics. And allocation of chargebacks, things like that. You learn about that in the IPMA program. It's not just from the ownership base. It could be from a lease space. It could be from providing a, as a property manager. Technology. This, I love this stuff. If, so technology. We are going to go into some uh, more detail on that. And uh, I think, how do we want to do this, Tony? I think we talked about it. I could do it now or do it later. We'll do it after. All right. So... Uh, Monitor and evaluate trends. You can create a vision, which is what I feel we've done here. You start putting things in place with an eye to the future, not an eye to the short term. Facilities technology is getting huge. I, I sat in a meeting a couple of years ago, and I hope I'm not talking out of turn, but uh, the facilities database, IP addresses, and all the points dwarfs the rest of the library, and that's just on the facility side. We're our own network. What's happening next? It's because we have all these devices. You know, we, we didn't know this was going to happen, but facilities technology, facilities IT, it's huge. We have uh, some devices back there that the minute you walk into a room, it'll, it'll do facial recognition. It'll decide what the temperature is based on wh where you want that floor. So let's say in the old days, you could put a thermostat on the wall, and you tried to get it right around head level um, or right around shoulder level, and then you, you found out that your primary customer's not quite to that level. <laughs> And, uh, or height challenge, or height very, very tall. And you know, in their stratosphere, it's a different temperature range, or a different draft. Well, now you can, you've got technology that can handle any of that, okay? So um, you also could, you, you've got Wi-Fi, Li-Fi, you have li Wi-Fi controls on all your lighting. You can have somebody come into a building and just turn on that certain area, or provide those certain services wherever that person goes. Uh, you come in with a key card, but you've, you've borrowed your key card from somebody else. It recognizes your face, says, no, that's not you. And zap, you're nothing but ashes on the floor. No, I'm just kidding. Um, so those things go on. So smart buildings, utilization, measuring your cost per square foot, utility costs, things like that. We'll get into that. So you have a whole bunch of new platforms. Uh, there's CAFM, uh, computerized maintenance management systems, and so on. How do those all tie in, and how do you do for buildbacks? So... Again, IFMA credentials, distinguish yourself, invest in your future, see the impacts and challenges with clarity, demonstrate your knowledge and understanding, which I hope I did that today and are very quick. I think I ran a little over. Um, you're the leadership, you're the, you're the leader of your facilities group. If you're that facilities manager and that's what you want to be, people look to you, whether you're running the streets, the grounds, landscaping, you name it. Oh, by the way, what's going on with my building on the inside and all this power and infrastructure? Boy, I have to know a little bit about everything. That's you. So be recognized and an expert in your field. You gain that credibility. People know they can count on you. When all else fails, they'll turn to you, and you're going to be that calm in the storm. Because you know what? Uh, I have this little saying at my desk, if I can remember it. A calm sea never made a uh, competent sailor. It's basically the message. So you're going to have rough seas. Calm the waters and keep sailing your boat and build that foundation. That's my presentation. And uh, I will get into some technology later, but let's turn it over to Tona.
Better? Yeah, that's much better. <laughs> Thank you for coming out today, especially to the North End. So my presentation is about IFMA credentials, but make FM a career of choice. And that's what I've done in my career. What does IFMA stand for? So IFMA stands for International Facility Management Association. IFMA is the world's largest and most widely recognized international association for facility management professionals, supporting 24,000 members in more than 100 countries. Represents 136 chapters and 16 councils worldwide. The members manage more than 78 billion feet of property. That's a lot of property. IFMA's mission is to globally advance and support the practice of, of facility management. I joined the IFMA Seattle Chapter Board in 2018. I wanted to raise the visibility of FM. In my role as Programs Committee Co-Chair, I diversified the locations of the Lunch and Learn programs. Before today, we have always held the Lunch and Learns at the Benaro Hall in downtown Seattle. So I asked the board, we are the greater Seattle chapter, not the Seattle chapter. What about our North End folks? What about our East Side folks? We need to rep represent them. We need to be all inclusive. So that's what I, that was my mission when I started. Uh, so today, that's what we're gonna be doing and then in, maybe in the future we'll be holding it on the East Side. We've actually held networking events um, up north as well at Funko. I wanted to reach all of our members and provide meaningful content to our programs by covering the core competencies of facilities management. The power of our voice. We need to find our voice. So part of that is gaining visibility for our chapter. I decided to reach out to a thought leader in our industry, Mike Petrusky. I thought, what the heck, I'm gonna give him a call. He doesn't know me, but that doesn't matter. And yes, I understand he's based in Washington DC, but I still want him to fly here. <laughs> <laughs> he took my call. We had a really great conference call. At the end of the call, he said, I'm coming out there, Tona. I will present for your lunch and learn. And I said to him, I can't pay you. You're gonna have to fly at your own cost. And he still said yes. After the conference call, he said, I'd like to interview you for my podcast because I think you're something special. So facilities management has always been referred to as a male-dominated industry. More women are entering the industry now and making great impacts. We are changing the landscape of how FM is viewed. So in October, I'll be presenting on a panel about women in FM. Uh, my other panelists will be Heidi from Funko, she's the facilities director there, and Shay Hughes, which is CEO of Hughes Marino. She was also, her company was listed as number one company to work for in Forbes. And the moderator will be my lovely co-chair, Sally Chen. So please join us for both the September and October Lunch and Learn. It's supposed to be great. So use your voice. So, the, obviously you can see IFMA has a lot of resources. So I would encourage to people to attend the conferences. This is a chance for you to network, um, reach out to mentors, and gain a lot of insight in FM. We also have the FMJ magazine, which is very helpful. It lists industry trends, um, and I've read that. And we have IFMA Engage, which is a forum that FMs can ask questions and reach out to other like-minded FMs globally. Excellence is never an accident. It is always the result of high intention, sincere effort, 
and intelligent execution. It represents the wise choice of many alternatives. Choice, not chance, determines our destiny. That quote is from Aristotle. My credential path has been a deliberate one. I, I made FM my career of choice. I obtained several industry-related credentials. In May 2017, I completed my UW Certificate of FM, and um, Christina will talk more about that uh, awesome program. After that, I completed my FMP in 2017 in December, and then I recently completed my SFP. I am currently studying for the CFM. I barely sleep. <laughs> the credentials provide me with subject matter expertise and keeps me up to date in industry trends. I have applied that knowledge in my everyday role here at Snow Owl Libraries. Snow Owl Libraries is a sustainable leader. Some of the initiatives that we have rolled out are composting and single stream recycling at 13 of the 23 libraries. Some of them are city owned, so we can't. Um, we have adopted green janitorial cleaning, different color rags, um, so that's really important. And then we've also adopted chemical free landscaping. The benefits of composting are waste aversion, cost savings, reuse natural resources, and really important, supports the library's sustainability goals. There you can see all of the libraries listed. And 1.6 tons composting per week equals 26 cars off the road per year. That's pretty impressive. I had to throw in a curtain. <laughs> if my credentials has provided me the foundation and the credibility in the industry, through IFMA, I have gained valuable networks, mentors, and gone ongoing educational opportunities. It has also given me a voice to advocate for programs, and I will. The board knows this. Now I'd like to hand over the podium to my next speaker, Christina May. She is the program manager for the University of Washington. She will talk about the UW Certificate of Facility Management Program, which I'm an alumni of. Hello. Thanks, Tona. Thanks, everybody. It's really a pleasure to be here today. and. and have a chance to meet with everyone and get away from my desk. Usually I'm in the uh, tucked away in the corner of the tower uh, at the University of Washington, so it's really a pleasure to, to be here with all of you today. And I'm going to, we're going to fly through because <laughs> I know it's a Friday afternoon and I want to make sure that you all have a chance to get your questions answered about everything that we talked about today. Um, but again, my name is Christina May. I am the program manager with the University of Washington Professional and Continuing Education uh, Division. And um, I'm here to talk to you about a, a program I'm passionate about today, the Certificate in Facility Management, um, and our relationship with IFMA and the varying credentials. Um, now that we've talked more about the importance of getting certified and pursuing credentials, um, I want to make sure that you know um, about the, the UW program and how it can help you on that path as well. So this is our very our brief agenda. <laughs> I'll start off telling you a little bit more about the UW Professional and Continuing Education Division, what we're all about, who we serve. I'm going to talk about our alignment with IFMA's competencies, which Brian outlined earlier. And we're also going to talk about what you'll learn in the program, as well as a little bit about the students we usually see in the certificate. And then we won't talk about your questions quite yet. We'll do that all together at the end here. So this is a view of uh, our beautiful University of Washington campus, probably taken some time in the spring. You can see all of our cherry blossoms there. Do we have any Huskies in the room today? Woo, awesome. If you haven't had a chance to go check out the quad when the cherry blossoms are in bloom, I highly recommend it. It is stunning. It is breathtaking. But um, while a lot of you probably know about the University of Washington, 
What you may not know is our reach. We really have a global reach at this point. Um, over 700 acres uh, with over 500 buildings and those span 50 locations in 10 countries, which is incredible. So we have not only a wonderful reputation locally in the greater Seattle area, but now we're reaching globally as well. So um, we're ranked number 10 in the world for universities, number two for public universities. I like to throw that stat out because I think it's pretty impressive. Uh, we're gunning for that number one spot next year. <laughs> Um, and something before we move on, uh, I had a chance to talk to a few people today. Something that I really uh, took away from is people here come from different backgrounds. They have various reasons for coming today. But I think the common thread among us is our dedication to continuing to improve ourselves, to lifelong learning. And that's something that I, I really enjoy being a part of with the continuing education division. Um, that's really who we serve. We're here to help people continue to further their education and professional development. We actually have programs for students as young as five, all the way up to retirees. So uh, we truly are here for lifelong learners. Um, but within continuing education, I typically work with adult learners. Um, and that's the case with our certificate program in facility management. We serve mid-career professionals who usually are working full time while taking our program. So I like to start off by bragging about our instructors, uh, one of whom is with us today. Robert, I'm so sorry I have to call you out. <laughs> Robert Blakey is one of our wonderful instructors in the program, uh, and Larry. Robert teaches our first and third class, and Larry teaches our second course in the winter. Um, and that's, I think, one of the huge benefits to taking a program with us. Uh, you are not learning necessarily from faculty. You're learning from professionals who have uh, many years of experience in the field and a lot of, of experience to bring to share with their students. So I think that's a huge benefit to taking a program with us. So I had to call them out. So let's talk a little bit about our relationship with IFMA, um, since that's the theme of the day is, is credentialing. Um, we do have a relationship with IFMA. We have an official competency aligned curriculum that was dealt, developed by IFMA. And um, so we do align with their 11 competency areas that Brian outlined earlier today. I won't go over those again. I think he, I think he did a great job. Um, but we, we align our curriculum through what's called FMLS, Facility Management Learning System. So that is a system and tools that our students can use as they progress through the certificate program to learn about those different competency areas. And if they're preparing to take one of those certifying exams with IFMA, it's a great stepping stone to help them prepare for that goal. We'll very quickly talk about the learning outcomes. This is very broad overview of what you'll learn in this program. There's so much that goes into being a, a competent facility manager, as many of you know. Um, so it's hard to include it in one slide, um, but I, I did my best. So students in this program will learn key concepts in commercial facility management. So that includes strategic planning, real estate issues that might come up. We'll talk about the latest in sustainability trends, lead, we'll talk about green building methods, technology innovations. You'll learn about design processes that enable coordination with architects, planners, contractors, engineers. And you'll learn techniques for managing staff and working with various stakeholders uh, and tenants. I think that's a, a pretty broad overview of what you'll learn. Um, but something else that I really like to tell people about is it's not just theory that you're going to be learning in the program you very much will be getting hands-on opportunities to apply these concepts that you'll learn in projects, assignments. You'll go on site visits with Larry and Robert um, to really get a sense of what the job looks like and, and apply those concepts in a hand-on way, culminating in the final capstone course uh, where you'll actually put together a project, working on a business case that you can add to your professional portfolio. So I want to talk a little bit about the students who usually join us for this program. I've got up here our admission requirements to give you a sense of what we're looking for when students apply to the program. You might notice um, an alignment with uh, what the requirements are for the CFM exam. Um, so that is intentional. Um, but we do see, really, I would say three tracts of students who come to our program. Um, first, we see students who are not necessarily in facility management yet. They're likely coming from a relevant field, project management, construction, engineering, um, admin work, and they're wanting to transition into the role of facility manager. 
but they need something to help them take that next step. So we see a lot of students come into our program from various backgrounds like that. We also see students who are working in facilities roles, but want the program to really, um, really uh, help them take the next step and move into more of a management or leadership role. So this program is gonna help you do that. Uh, and finally, we do see some students who may already have uh, a credential with IFMA and are looking to earn those maintenance points. You can do that with our program, so um, they, they sometimes choose to take this and really learn about any updates, trends in the field, since we do have a, a very relevant curriculum. And that is our certificate schedule up there. So uh, we designed this program for adults who are lead busy lives and are working full time typically while they're taking this program. So we schedule it every other Saturday from 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. That means you still get to enjoy your weekends every other weekend. Um, and in between those sessions, you have plenty of time to read and sort of think about everything you learned in the prior week, prepare for the weekend ahead. So it consists of three different courses um, over the course of nine months. And um, students do pay tuition quarterly. It's $1,300 per course. We are uh, very excited to be starting our next cohort October 6th. So that's coming up here and uh, currently accepting applications for that. And we'll continue to accept applications up until two weeks before the program starts. So just some final thoughts I wanna leave everyone with today. Um, again, I think a lot of us in the room, we come from different backgrounds and experience levels. Some of us are newer to facility management. Some have been working in the field for years and are really more mentors. Um, whatever the case, um, there are different there are different students that we're here to really serve. If you're more of a mentor and you know somebody who um, feels stuck in their career and they need something to help that take, take that next step and serve as a catalyst towards the next level in their career, this is gonna be a great option for them to do that. Or maybe you yourself um, have been working as a facility manager for some time or um, you're wanting to take one of those credentialing exams, uh, this is gonna be a great stepping stone towards that goal. So. Thanks, everybody. I appreciate being here. I want to say one thing. Uh, I took up too much time on my talk, so I, want, I have a system I want to show you. We've got a fault diagnostics analytics program that is incredibly sharp, but at the same time, I want to respect everybody's time. So it is a little after 1 o'clock, so if anybody does need to take off and step out, feel free, um, and, and you can do that. Other than that, Robert. I just wanted to add a couple of more points on the uh, uh, U of W program yeah. uh, uh, just briefly before you get into that. The, I, the one thing I wanted to stress uh, first was that the program is really aligned as a, a, a one-year study program towards taking the CFM exam. So uh, the, you have the opportunity not only to get the certificate from the University of Washington, which has uh, a very good cachet with employers inside of our area uh, as far as uh, promoting uh, your career to the next level. But in addition to that, you have the benefit of, of a, a measured step-by-step -step program to study for the entire year towards all 11 competencies and then passing your CFM exam. Yeah, great point. I'm sorry, I couldn't hear the question. Uh, there are three quarters, uh, three courses, uh, one each quarter, uh, fall, winter, and spring. And in the course of those three quarters, we cover all 11 competency areas uh, of the CFM exam structure. Sally, go ahead. If you, if uh, I, I would like to show the other program, but we don't have to, and you know, I can do that with anybody that's left in the room, and go over the. Uh, what do we feel? Kaizen How system. are we feeling? Yeah. All right. Let's go for it. Let's okay. Go for it. Just, well, we'll go real quick. We got it scripted. I wanted to give uh, Delta Connect a chance to show off some of the toys as well. Okay. Here we go. <laughs> We're gonna pull up Kaizen. It's fault diagnostics pr program. It helps us meet current energy code down in Seattle, even though we're not there. But I mean, that was a driver. We see these things coming in and how are we gonna be more efficient with our buildings? How are we gonna not 
run our equipment for too long? How are we going to keep our utility costs down? How are we going to be, have, build that strong, solid foundation where we can reduce costs and have funds to spend on other things? So here we go. It is right here. I'm going to step out of the way. Um, here we are. This is the main screen. This has many of the, the Snow Isle buildings on it. Not all of them. It's the ones that make sense. Remember, there's a value decision. Some of these buildings, you know, we're better off with just a plain plumb thermostat and, and maybe a Wi-Fi connection. So here we go. We're going to go into uh, uh, the manager view for Snow Isle Libraries. This is our main building that we're at right now. You can see it's broken up into five different areas. So the fault detection, energy, golden standard, infrastructure, and then integrity KPIs. Um, let's go into the energy view. Okay, and here we go. I can see, you know, we've got strip heat. Why are we supply fans? I can take from a color metric, you know, how are things running for this time frame? If we're in the yellow and the orange and we're not going green, it means I'm probably burning up more than I want to right now. But we're running the supply fans a lot. But then again, maybe that's a good way to do a lot more fresh air cooling. And I'm not running my compressors and so on. And we can go in and look at that. And then we also have a technical operator view. I'm kind of going a little bit fast here. We'll get into a little more detail. If you got that system view. Oh, let's pull up. Uh, oh, RTU3 was pretty. Let's see. Go ahead and just pull up any one. HP1, which is in this room. So here we are. Oh, hey, we've got an insight right there. Determine if supply fan is continuously not running. You're going to click on, up. Oh, oh, this is CO2 sensor. So it can do an analytics. It can compare how it's operating to tell me ahead of time that the CO2 sensor, which is going to help control our outside air intakes and how much we're using, uh, is operating properly or if it doesn't need to be replaced. We don't go have to go calibrate it and hook up some equipment. We can take a look at calculations and analytics, and we already know that it's faulty. So this was an example of that. Um, I'd like Don or someone else actually get into that, maybe Eric. I don't know if he wants to, if I put him on the spot. Um, <laughs> but it, there, you can tell. The system tells you it's faulty. You need to go replace it. Then the technician, he just comes out and replaces the one thing. We don't have to go check them all. We don't have to calibrate them all. We go to the ones that we need. I think we had two that had failed, so we replaced just those two. Okay, um, let's, let's move in over into reports. I think this is more of a facility managers type thing here, Don. Service center reports. Let's take a look at schedules changed. So I got busy here one day. We were having some humidity things go on and this and that, and I started just making all kinds of changes. So we have a thing called the golden standard. And the golden standard says you ever go into your controls and you turn on a fan, and, uh, or you turn on, I don't know, you switch the reversing valve to heating mode, and you never even let it go back to cooling mode, and you just leave it that way. Then all of a sudden, six months later, comes around. Like, oh, no. I left that on. When did I do that? Um, so that post-it note fell off your desk because somebody came in at night and cleaned up, you know? So whatever. But this will tell you. You'll get, a, you'll, get a, you'll get a message. Hey, you've got this on. This is outside your standard. Do you want to accept it as your new standard, or do you want to... Uh, Change it back. You can get things like that. So uh, occupancy schedules. So I made some changes in the schedules. It tells me what I changed. Is that just a short-term fix or long-term? You can just put mo momentary adjustments just for a day. But here I did full system changes. So I was looking more at my energy use. How, uh, how is the building being used? And what's the heat load during the day? How is that affecting some of the people and the equipment that are inside our building? So I made a bunch of changes, and it'll track that for me. Let's go into the device backups. This tells me whether or not we're backing up our, our platforms, which, if you've ever had a server failure, is highly important in making sure that you get that done. So I believe we're all up to date. So we have, at least at the service center, we're back, we're up to date. We keep all of our stuff in the cloud. We don't. Uh, we've got multiple redundant backups now. We don't ever risk ever losing anything. I'm just barely getting into this. Let's go into, this is the good stuff, objects in fault.
Here we go. Now, Don, I think we can. So, SRV is our code for service center. Rooftop unit number three, room CO2 sensor. We already talked about that. We know that's good. Oh, motion sensor. We may have a faulty motion sensor, which is built into thermostats, which, again, we talked about being a futurist. I could actually start using all of my thermostats, all of my door contacts, on my control system is my security system. And then we also have new technology that's being developed by our vendor, and I'm sure other vendors are going to do it. There are many things called room controllers, which these room controllers can provide your occupancy. They can, the one we have here does facial recognition. You know, is that really who it says it is, and what do we need to provide for that person, depending on where they go, um, and so on. Rooftop unit number one, heating. What's going on here, Don? Oh, we'll have to look at trend log. We've got a problem with the trend log. So we've got a trend log fault. Okay. So let's go into um, manual inputs and outputs. And then we can view that. All right. Bypass damper, out, out, commanded to manual. So if you've left something in manual, again, we have golden standard, but these are things where you can quickly look at, see if you've got, turned something off or on, and you've left it and set it and forget it, and so on. Um, somewhat valuable. I'm going to, I might even go off script. Let's go to golden standard all. I might go off script, Don. So I might go into some stuff that I know it'll work for us from a facility manager's point of view. Uh, gold standard all. All right, so, and here we're seeing that we have, I have changed so many of these, and this is where the facility manager is off doing a whole bunch of stuff, and his controls guy's going, oh, no. You know, the facility manager went hog wild again, changed everything on me. Do I back this up as the new standard or not? He's going to have to ask me. This is just a simple report. So remember, this is the reporting function. One of the things you'll see here is that when we're in the reporting function, you can't necessarily click and go right to stuff with a hot link. We can do that too. But this is just a report. Say all these things are out of alignment. I can assess each one, check it off, say, hey, uh, I think I'm going to go back and keep these. And then we can go and um, decide what we want to do. But I may have a reason for why I did all this, and I can talk with my controls tech. Um, I'm going to go to, uh, let's get to this one. This is something that the facility manager, I'm going to go to the KPIs, and it's the VAV, or really VVT. Room temp versus set point. You got that? Here we are. This is cool. You can go floor by floor, building by building. This is just one building. It tells me I've got five that just are not, that are unacceptable. The temperature is being provided to the room versus set point, no good. People uncomfortable, we're not even close. And then we would dig into that. And then I've got, say, 87% that are really, they're satisfactory. You know, I'd probably even dig into the 65 plus. I don't know about you, but 65% score on my test isn't good enough, right? It might meet the, the needs, but it's really not good enough. So we've got others that are comfortable and excellent. But we definitely want to dig into the unacceptables and get the low-hanging fruit first. So we've obviously got something wrong. What's going on at those, the, at those areas? And we can dig into that. So five systems failing. Does this scroll down, Don? Yeah, uh, that's just a trend. We're going to go into a different one. Let's go to RTU4. So here are the zones. So here are the scores for RTU4. And then we've got our scores right over there on the average, 92, 93, 95, 76, 76, and 81. You get the little 15 days prior kind of tells you how are you trending and tracking. The flatter, the more straight across, the better off you're meeting that objective and you're staying within range. It's just a quick windshield view, drive-by of what's really going on. Uh, let's go into, we could look at RTU5 if we want. I've got a lot more zones there. Again, 
you see how you're performing. I want to go see what's going on at five zone one. I think. Huh. Some of these scores have changed over the last night, so we might want to look at it. Min and max. I've got, oh boy, our zone six and zone five, we have got a huge variance there of what's really happening. So that would be something to go look into, you agree? Yeah, okay. Um, so that's that. I'm going to jump here all the way to Energy, Energy Service Center. Not trying to hide anything. We didn't go in and fix anything. We just said, hey, let it run. Um, going to Energy, let's take uh, the supply fans for the year and select them and then this is where I just like to bounce around. So here's supply fans. Uh, go ahead and select a month. Any month. Go for July. How are we running? Here's each date of the month versus the temperature. How often are we run? So a lot of fresh air cooling. We try to do a ton of that. I'm sure a lot of you do. And then also, um, go ahead and dig in. Yeah, let's go into the day or the week or the day will work. So by what time of the day? So you can see when you're ramping up, when the people are showing up, and what are you, how are you supplying that by the hour? Not, you know, I, I mean, that's, that's good information, but at the same time, you know, it depends on when you need it and how you need it. You know, it, it's just going to tell me I'm following schedule, big deal, move on. But there are some other things you can get to. Let's go into the compressor heating and cooling. Get the breakdowns on those. DX heating. So why? So 7 a.m., We've got some heating going on. Which one's coming on? Well, there you go. What the heck is going on with RTU-6? Just happens to be our executive suite. <laughs> um, couldn't possibly be an overzealous setting to take care of my most important customer. Um, so, but still, I want to find out what's going on. Why? Why there? Because I really didn't need that. What a waste. I shouldn't have needed that. Not in today's, not, we've got great temperatures outside. What is going on? So I want to fix that. So you can dig right into it, right away. I'll get that alert for the day, and we'll get on it. So that's one thing. Let's go into the cooling breakdown. We could, Don. Yeah, it looks okay. Yeah, and we're, we're in day mode here. So... There, if I compare that to a previous day, we're actually doing pretty good for today. Considering yesterday was a lot cooler than today, I believe today is a little warmer. Um, we're doing okay. Oh, here you can see them all overlaid at once. It just depends on how you want to look at that. But I certainly have something, some issue going on with uh, uh, RTU-7, a ton of cooling mode. Well, it's right next to the IT guys. What are they doing? Um, who's got their monitor backed up against the thermostat? You know, it's like, what are you doing? Do you see what that is on the wall? And that's heat coming off your monitor. Look what you did to me. Um, so they don't know. They're just, they're just trying to be comfortable, right? So uh, in the future, we have room controllers. We don't necessarily need to have thermostats on the walls. We can just shoot a laser beam into the space, decide what level we want to capture the temperature, and whammo, we're not occupying anybody. Or we're assessing the, what's going on in there. So it's going to be different. Right? You guys are laughing at me. It's a little different. That's fine. Yeah, laser, infrared, whatever, you know. I'm painting a picture. These are word pictures, right? I like the one with the optical character recognition. You, you know, Tony borrows Bob's badge. He comes in, and you're, you're toast. You don't look like him. Or the poor guy that grew a beard over the weekend. Um, so that's, that's for cooling breakdowns. You can look at these things. Insight management. This is the funnest part. This is where you get to kill. Instead of coming in and maintaining all your pieces of equipment, you can come in and selectively pick just certain pieces of equipment. You can say, you know what? I've only got these five devices. Oh, gosh, I'm going to have more. Um, you only have a certain number of devices that all really need to be looked at. Everything else is communicating, the analytics back and forth. Last time I was maintained, these things are great. Don't spend your time on them. Don't go look at them. Go look at the things that actually say they have issues. So here they are. Um, let's, let's get some, oh, outside air damper leaking. Let's, let's click on that one. That's a high one. We got a lot more high today. No, I'm scared. Um, OK, so here we are. There's our trend log. And if you scroll, we can, we can expand that. You can see we are just, yeah, there you go. That was just one span. I've got trends way back, not those days. But we can move anywhere. And you know why were we offline there for so long? Maybe we're missing data? I don't know. 
Uh, we'll find out. I'll certainly be talking to Don later. Um, <laughs> so RTU7, it's the IT area, and um, this will catch up in a matter of seconds, won't it, Don? Yeah, it's that quick. There you are. That's probably too much data for right now. Um, there we go. We can get into a more finite amount and see how things are running. We've got our supply fan stat. We've got our, you know, whether or not the mixed air damper is closed or open. Um, the return air temperature, what's that trending at? What are we using? How are we mixing it? Where are we? And so on with outside air. I mean, everybody's trying to cool the outside air. Why wouldn't you this time of year, right? It comes to a certain point, though. You don't want to be pulling in 85 degree air. That's just going to, you know, how much of that you're going to bring in. And, but then you also have your CO2 and your occupant comfort and energy levels in the building. So you, you have to think about all these things. Remember, we're facilities people. So these are things that you can look at. We can trend super fast. And then all this data is being cross-referenced and compared in, in ways that I couldn't even hardly go into. But we use this on a, on a, I won't say a daily basis. I'm not to the point where I've incorporated in my routine. I have, a, I have a team of three Toms out in the field. Tona's making sure I'm working. And, um, and, uh, and, and, you know, and I'm trying to get things done and make sure that I stay out of Tona's way. Um, and then work with all the vendors and so on. So I want to go into, uh, can we go back to Insight? Okay, let's pull up, um, can we go scroll down? I want to see if I have something else in there that I, that's interesting. Uh, how about next page? Oh, mixed air damper is hunting. Supply fan has been off for a prolonged period of time. Well, that goes all the way back to 2017. I'm surprised those are in there. Um, mixed air damper is hunting. So some of these have probably been fixed and we haven't acknowledged them. You come over here and we'd give it a thumbs up and say, hey, that's an old issue. We took care of it. It's gone. It's going to stay there until you acknowledge it. So see right there where he's going to acknowledge it. It's done. It's gone. Done. Okay, but let's go for mixed air damper hunting. We want to send that to Rob. We just email it off. He gets an entire sheet up here. Oh, oh this is your list, huh? Yeah. On mine, I've already, oh, there's Rob. Send it to both of us. So, boo, I, Rob gets it. I get it. I would normally be on mine, and I'd send it to Rob or Don. And uh, you enter in the message. Basically, what they get is they get the trend log. They get possible resolutions. It tells them exactly what to look for. Or it'll tell them, I wish I had one of those ones. Hey, the belt's slipping. You might want to go check this out because it can tell or we're short cycling. Here's causes for it. This is what we think based on all the other analytics and comparisons. This is what you need to go fix. Make sure you bring this part with you. The guy shows up. He's already got everything he needs. And he only has to work on the one item. That's the kind of stuff we're doing and starting to get to. So it's, it's a change. Um, but we're looking at that to reduce our ongoing maintenance costs. It's going to cut it in half, if not more. We only take care of the things that need to be taken care of. You still need to look at stuff. But analytics and fault diagnostics, uh, your mechanical side, I don't know, if you're in the public sector, we pay prevailing wage. It's a lot of money. Um, and that's something that we need to try and just maintain the things that need to be taken care of. But we also have to have good stewardship of our resources and make sure that we're maintaining those assets and life cycles and so on. So this, this does a lot of that. Um, there's a whole bunch of different ways to go over it. If anybody ever wants to meet me offline and go over it in more detail, I am completely into it. I can show you so much more. Um, I love this stuff. And uh, Snow Isle has afforded an opportunity to look at these things and say, we want to be an excellent steward of our resources. And they've allowed these kind of things to happen. But if you go and you, as you learn about facilities, you can go justify these things because they pay for themselves. We, we put our first one in at Snohomish. It paid for itself in year one. And we had already done retro commissioning. We've already upgraded equipment. We already made sure that everything was running, we thought, perfectly. We put this online. We had to pay a little bit for it, but we were already building the sensor platform. We were doing, which I, I love using this term, virtual metering. Um, we were doing virtual metering as far back as almost seven years ago. I think we'll say six, not quite seven yet. And we were starting to say, hey, you know what? We've got the amperage. We've got the flow rate. We've got all these different things. You know what? If we, if we reverse engine that and then the BTU calculation, we, we can tell how much energy that's using. And then you compare that back against the baseline of the meter. So all you do is you, you, get, you get a CT on the meter, maybe a few other ones, got to get some motors. 
and you can figure out what your, your heat load is or your, your usage. You can start developing percentages of use and compare it to the, to the baseline meter. And you know what your compressors are doing, your heating's doing, your strip heat, your supply fans. And guess what? You get all your mechanical stuff, all of a sudden the only thing you're left with is, what's my PC load? Oh, what's my lighting load? Well, I know what my lighting circuits are. They're over here. And I know what that, and I know what my PC, PC load and my printer load is. Guess what? I can reverse calculate all that too. And I know exactly what all my devices in the building are using. And guess what? Susie Q over there has got a space heater because that is way out of line. And I just had this, we, just yesterday, I just love this. I'm, I'm, all, I'm in the background, everybody's quiet. We had this meeting, it was a big uh, security consultant. Some of you may know Bo Mitchell. Uh, anybody know Bo Mitchell? So we had about a five hour presentation from Bo Mitchell about all our libraries yesterday. I love it, he gets in and he's just ripping us apart. You gotta do this, you gotta do that. If you know Bo, he says, you're gonna hate me when I'm done. And I'm just sitting back there being quiet. And he goes, all the buildings he did, he found one space heater. I'm in the back, yeah! You know? <laughs> Because, you know, we're, yeah, it, we hate space heaters. They're safety issues. They're energy draws. They just they mess everything up. This room's a little bit cool right now. But um, so regardless, get back on point. You can email these things back out right away. You can focus just on the insights. Insights also drive a dollar value to it. They determine, hey, you're going to save 1000 bucks if you fix this item. And, uh, or this is how it's going to impact you over the next year. So that's really all I got. I will end it. I'm sorry for running over. And thank you very much. If you ever want to meet afterwards, please grab my card. We'll do it. Thank you, everybody, for coming. Um, if we have any questions, um, we'll stick around. We'll be around, okay? Thank you again, everybody, for uh, sticking around for a, a late. Yes, Robert. I just wanted to add one thing. Thank you for coming. Sorry to take up extra time. For people yeah, that are interested in.